Hey guys, this week we're going to talk about one of the most famous parts of Halo. The ODSTs, they're the shock troopers of the UNSC. They jump, quite literally and figuratively, feet first into hell. These troops are the future envisioning of modern airborne forces, but it's one thing to jump from a plane and another altogether to jump in from orbit. Is that even survivable? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to break it down both from the lens of military application as well as some real world science that shows if it is or isn't. As a quick plug, if you enjoy kind of realistic sci-fi content like this, particularly I like to focus on Halo, consider subscribing to the channel. It means a lot. All right, let's jump into it. For ODSTs, you know, they use a single occupant exoatmospheric insertion vehicle, aka a drop pod. And that's how they reach their targets. Sometimes they're inserted as small teams and sometimes they come in as a massed force, like what we see in Halo 3 or EST. They drop in from ships. They have ceramic ablative plating on the bottom. This helps absorb the heat from re-entry, preventing it from getting into the vessel itself. Once they're established on a descent, they use a small drag chute and it deploys. We see a break loose in the game. So realistically, I don't think it's gonna do much to adjust terminal velocity per se, but it may aid in finalizing impact point, as well as kind of making some end game maneuvering. Shortly before impact, rockets fire to reduce the impact shock. At least, that's according to some expanded lore. There was an old document found on Bungie.net when Halo 3 ODST came out that mentions it, but I never really saw it in game. I decided to include it because it's relatively realistic, but I'm not quite sure how established that is in the lore. We know from looking at draw pods, they feature significant padding. They have radio and video communication abilities. They have a crash cage, which I interpret to mean like crumple zones around and particularly at the bottom. Post-impact charges blow so that the door flies out, allowing the occupant to be free. In the cold protocol, and this is part of the expanded universe, it mentions that drop pods carry emergency fuel with the ability to do a short takeoff and land elsewhere. But I find this highly impractical, especially if you're coming in as a team to have a single individual kind of like bouncing around. Okay, let's talk application and science. Starting with application, we know in the current world we have airborne forces. I mean, they're featured by most modern countries, but really it's only gonna be your true professional fighting forces that are capable of conducting them. That's because they're incredibly skill intensive, confusing, and relatively disorganized. And it's almost by design. See, they rely on incredibly strong junior level leaders like young officers and NCOs to properly execute. Everyone gets kind of scrambled up when they drop in. Being able to self organize into small units makes you effective as a fighting force. It's later on you kind of reorganize back into your previously established echelons of command. In terms of orbital insertions, the US military actually has looked into that. DARPA, a kind of really out there research group in the military, as well as the Air Force Research Labs, came up with Project Sustain in the early 2000s. This project hasn't really seen much movement since, but what they described was the ability to use either a rocket or a hypersonic vehicle to take a squad of Marines into high atmosphere, kind of like the border of space, and then back down to the surface. This provides an incredibly fast reaction time for anything that happens on the globe. We're talking two hours or less. The US already kind of has forces postured for that, but without the ability to go into space, it obviously takes much longer. Now, when it comes to science and aerodynamics and the drop pod itself, I use the dimensions from Halo Encyclopedia as well as it, what I was able to find on the Halopedia online. I added in some of my own assumptions, and what I found is that it has a rough cross section of 6.21 meters squared. It weighs in at 0.86 tons, which is roughly 1,700 pounds, 700 kilograms. I ended up coming up with a drag coefficient of 0 0.54. And this is roughly equivalent to a spherical body with that cross-section area. The reason I went with the sphere is the drop pod to me is not as blunt as say a cube, but it doesn't really have as much of a streamlined shape that you would expect on say like a teardrop, raindrop, aircraft, what have you. Settling for that number in the middle, I feel like is a decent enough initial hack until, you know, one of us is able to take a 3D model of it into, say, a wind tunnel. But using these rough numbers does give us a terminal velocity 202 feet per second. Now, to give that into a comparison, a skydiver belly down is roughly 176 feet per second. Bringing it all together, a drop pod then falling at 202 feet per second can be survivable. And allow me to explain. At 202 feet per second, weighing 1,720 pounds, the impact force is going to be roughly 108,000 pounds of force. Spread out over 0.1 seconds, that's 63 Gs of acceleration. But if you extend that to one second, it's only 6.3, which is where I trace it back to what I was talking about earlier in the expanded universe lore discussing the use of rocket brakes. Using rocket brakes just prior to impact, like it extends the amount of time you're feeling those forces, it really reduces the acceleration 
acceleration force or rather deceleration force of impact. Either way, both will still be survivable. See, NATO has done many crash studies, obviously military aircraft that tends to happen. They showed in human testing, all voluntary mind you, that an average adult can sustain 20 to 25 G's in the Z axis, that's kind of like up and down your spine, and then 45 G's in the X axis, that's gonna be like two and away from your chest. Involuntarily though, race car drivers have had some pretty bad accidents and they found they're able to survive impact forces well in excess of 100 to even 200 G's without significant injury. And that's largely attributed to the fact that they have proper restraints and a lot of safety features that diminish the instantaneous force. See, crashes tend to follow like a triangle kind of spike. You have a really quick ramp up to a high peak and then a quick drop back down. By lowering that peak and stretching the overall area of that force over a greater amount of time, it reduces the instantaneous kind of acceleration impulse, if you will, on the human body. And being as resilient as it is, that makes these accidents significantly more survivable. So tying that in what we know about the drop pod, bringing it all together, my proposal then is instead of sitting upright to rotate them backwards, have the occupants sit like 30 to 45 degrees reclined. What this means is that when you impact, more of the force is gonna be into your chest. On top of that too, because you're leaned back, your body should flail a lot less and you won't have to worry about secondary impacts. That's when, you know, during a crash, your body that's not being restrained kind of flails around. If you look at pilots and plane crashes, typically that initial impact isn't what kills them per se, it's when and their head bounces off to the display in front of them, breaking their skull. The seat itself should sit on rails. That way, when it does impact, it can slide into the drop pod a little bit lower, dampening, and again, extending the amount of time it's experiencing those forces. Having the upper, lower body, head, chin, chest area all secured, you can do things like restraints or they even have some experimental inflatable collars that kind of go around your neck, securing your jaw and chin. It kind of keeps your head from whipping around. And again, it's all about keeping you secure so that you can absorb the force, which is survivable, without getting hurt in any additional secondary injuries. All this combined means that even if the proposed rocket brake did fail, an occupant should theoretically be able to survive a 63G impact, unassisted, without injury, and still have the means to fight you. I mean, they might be days, their bell may have been rung, but they should still be capable of conducting combat operations. When we talk about mission sets, we usually see ODSTs in small teams, and that's actually very comparable to modern day special operations. They typically like to do small team ops. When we talk about airborne operations, they like to do high altitude, low opening, like halo jumps. It's one of the many in their tool set, but it's a particularly good one. The reason why that's good is high altitude means that you can't hear the plane, and low altitude for the opening of the chute means that you spend a lot less time visible to the adversary. I find this very comparable to an ODST drop. I mean, being realistic here, you're probably not going to see a spaceship with a naked eye unless you're looking very very closely. The drop pod itself is relatively small and again unless you get very lucky and you're right in front of it you probably wouldn't notice it until immediately prior to impact when it uses rocket brakes or immediately following impact when a dude jumps out with a rocket launcher. This is an incredible advantage preventing the adversary to have much of a heads up that you're attacking. This is even more useful when we talk about mass insertion of troops not just small teams. Much like we saw in Halo 3 ODST modern day airborne troops do a lot of things like securing landing zones, airfields, or other significant significant objectives. You mass thousands of troops in one location and you overwhelm the enemy before they can kind of recognize and form up a defensive force. Overall, I found that upon first glance, I thought, you know, ODSTs and jumping from orbit would be suicide. And it doesn't have to be. And it actually surprised me how realistic we could make drop pods survivable. A higher drag coefficient, you know, a high drag body, crumple zones, a specifically made seat, restraints, inflatables like airbags, all meant to distribute the force on impact means that the human body can survive. I mean, it's truly very resilient. Honestly, the only reason, in my opinion, we don't have ODST drop pods today is because we don't have a huge military footprint in space. I mean, we have satellites and whatnot, but we don't have like a fighting force just yet. I promise you though, the day we do, I would not be surprised if you see drop pod capabilities included. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's video. It was honestly a blast to make. It was very, very interesting. If you like content like this, please like and subscribe. It really does help me out as a small channel. In the meantime, hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Be safe and take care.